Okay, so, all right. Hello again, everybody. Um, so this is the second lecture of uh, high performance computing and aspects of computing in lattice gauge theories. Uh, as I was uh, telling uh, Bedros at the beginning, uh, for those of you, I hope you all received the instructions, the, so the GitHub link with instructions on how to set up to be ready for the hands-on, which will be uh, during the next lesson. Uh, if you have any problems, then I suggest uh, we stay on at the end of the lecture. If some of you cannot stay on, then maybe we can schedule uh, something else uh, 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 later on in the week. Um, uh, but for now, let's get started with this week's lecture. So, um, uh, I, I gave you last time a couple of practicals to do some, you know, practice in computing computational intensities, etc. And that's what I will cover in the next couple of slides before I go on to the main part of uh, this week's lecture. So I, I will um, uh, talk about those two exercises that I uh, ask you to try out. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll stop and take any questions if you have any uh, on, on those exercises in the previous lecture. Okay, so just to refresh your, your memories, um, last time, among other things, we talked also about uh, th these uh, concepts of counting the floating point, uh, the number of floating point operations done in a kernel, in a given kernel, the size of the uh, data that the kernel needs to uh, input and output, um, and then that this motivated the definition of this uh, intensity here, which symbolizes uh, IK, which is the kernel intensity, which is in units of flops per byte, uh, and gives you um, the, let's say, the requirements of the kernel in terms of the num number of floating point operations that it is required to do for a given uh, size of the data that it needs to read and write. Okay, and then um, and then um, another thing similarly we can define is the so-called machine intensity, which is basically uh, a, a quantity with the same units and it's uh, an analogous ratio, but it characterizes the, the computer. So gamma FP is the peak floating point rate and gamma IO is uh, the machine uh, uh, IO rate. Uh, and then uh, having these numbers at hand, one can sort of assess uh, what the bottleneck of a kernel will be on a given machine. So as I said last time, this is a, 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 a bit of a crude, let's say, way to do it. It's, it's sort of a high level first order or zeroth order approximation of how to find some bottlenecks uh, uh, between a computational kernel and and uh, a given machine. So as I said last time, if the kernel intensity is much larger than the machine intensity, then we say that we have a, a kernel that on the given machine is so-called compute bound, meaning that the bottleneck is likely to be floating point uh, performance. In other words, we don't have enough floating point on units on the machine to consume fast enough the data that is coming in. Whereas if the uh, opposite inequality holds in the middle there. Uh, then we say we have a memory bound kernel, meaning that we, we have enough floating point units. It's just that we don't have a, a broad enough, let's say bus, uh, uh, we don't have uh, uh, enough bandwidth to, uh, to, let's say, feed the floating point units at, at, a, at, a, at a, a sufficient pace. So the bottleneck, is the memory bandwidth. And then when, when the, the kernel intensity and the machine intensity are approximately the same, we say we have a balanced kernel. Okay, and then the first thing I asked you to do was to consider like a simple matrix matrix multiplication and try and work out the number of floating point operations, the IO, how many data you need to 
write and write into read from memory and write back into memory and figure out the intensity. So um, this makes it easier if you just look at the kernel in terms of the, the actual code, right? So we have here a nested loop going uh, n iterations, k iterations, m iterations, and you are, uh, in each iteration, you're doing two floating point operations, right? So you're doing an addition here and a multiplication here. Um, okay, you can avoid maybe one floating point operation because you don't necessarily need to add here the first in the first iteration, but that's really just a minor. Uh, uh, um, when, when n will be large, this will be a minor improvement in, in the number of floating point operations you need. So that's how you come to this uh, NFP being 2n times k times n. Then in terms of the IO, you need to read all elements of array A at least once. You need to read all elements of array B at least once. And then you at least need to write all element, elements of array C once. So the number of uh, bytes, the number of bytes that you need to read and write is uh, given by this expression where W is the is the word length. In other words, W is either eight bytes for double precision or four bytes for single precision. Okay, so if I take the uh, uh, intensity, which is a ratio, as we said, of these two numbers, you have something like this, which basically tells you that the kernel intensity depends on the dimensions. And actually what you see is that as you grow the dimensions of uh, uh, any of the arrays, then this denominator will become smaller. And so the intensity will grow. And if, if we just take a, a, a simple case of square matrices, everywhere square and equal sized matrices, then we take the dimensions to be equal, then you will end up with a kernel intensity, which is just proportional to uh, the, the, the uh, array size, so the, the array uh, uh, length, mm -hmm. the number of columns or rows. And then in, uh, if I compare this, for example, for uh, the case of uh, that Jules, Jules computer that I was talking about last time for which we figured out its machine intensity to be somewhere around 16 uh, flops per byte, then one can say that, for example, on joules, if we take W to be eight bytes, which is double position, then this kernel is memory bound when uh, the array dimension is about 200 or less, less than 200 um, elements. Whereas uh, as you increase the array size and you exceed 200, uh, um, 200 by 200 matrices, then this, uh, kernel starts becoming compute bound. Okay, and um, and then the next kernel that I ask you to look into a bit and, and think about how to count the floating point operations and bytes of I.O. was this complex AX plus Y operation. Um, so just uh, Y equals AX plus Y. Uh, Assuming you have n elements and x and y are both complex vectors or arrays, and a is a scalar, right? And so this is what it would look like in, in C code. For example, you would declare double precision complex x and y. Um, I guess you would memory allocate these really if uh, n is, 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 is indeed large, and then you would just naively, you would just iterate like this over the elements. Um, so the thing, the, the tricky bit with counting the floating point operations here is to recall that the complex variables are, you know, they're two, two component uh, structures. In, I mean, in, in C, they're two component structures. Um, so they have a real part and an imaginary part. And what would facilitate you in counting the floating point operations in this case would be to write the real and imaginary part of the left-hand side explicitly, so just write it out. So in that case, you would uh, get something like, 
like this, okay? So, um, yeah, don't worry if this is uh, the proper way to address real and imaginary parts in C. It's just demonstrative, it's just to demonstrate, right? So what you're really doing here is these two lines. So what this one line here hides is, is what's written down explicitly here. So for every element i of the arrays, the real part is really uh, this series, the, these three terms, right? Then the imaginary part is really these three terms. So, so now it's it, so, so, so now we've written this in terms of floating point operations of double precision variables, right? This uh, y dot real is double precision, y dot imaginary is double precision, and now we can go ahead and count the floating point operations. So the number of floating point operations for each iteration is simple to see now so you have one two three four five six seven eight right? two 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 there and two there uh, so it's n the number of iterations times eight floating point operations and then how about the data io well we need to read x once we need to read y once and we need to read uh, we need to write out probably y once so you need to read two vectors of length n and write out one vector of length n so it will be uh, six times the word length which in this pre in this case is eight bytes because i've explicitly put the most double here uh, times n uh, i'm not counting the reading of a because this presumably you just need to read it once and then it stays there in cache and so you don't need to read a which is a constant in each iteration so um, strictly speaking i should have added plus one here but because we're assuming that these ends are large uh, we just uh, this, this doesn't change the complexity really okay and then so the intensity is uh trivially now just four over three w and you see here that the, the dimension n, so the size of the array drops out. And so whether w is four, in which case ik will be a third, or whether w is eight, in which case ik will be one six, this um, kernel will likely be memory bound, with almost always be memory bound on any common architecture because most CPUs, GPUs, uh, uh, architectures, common architectures these days have a computational intensity which is higher than one. Okay, so um, so so do, does anybody have any questions before I move on to the main part of this uh, week's lecture? Um, I see some activity in the, oh, no, that's just Petros, okay. Okay, so um, there are no questions then, I can move on to uh, the outline of this week's lecture. So, okay, so this, this week will be, again, a bit like uh, last week's lecture in terms of introducing some, um, some concepts uh, like last time. Um, so I will focus more though on computational aspects of lattice gauge theories and this will be highly motivated also by uh, the case of lattice QCD. So first I want to introduce some things that some of you may have seen already but it's good to get some uh, let's say notation down or uh, see them in a bit more computational way. So I will introduce gauge theories on the lattice and specifically the path integral formulation and what the typical computational workflow is uh, when we uh, do simulations of lattice gauge theories. Um, then I'll talk a bit about the challenges uh, which will include things like errors and systematic uncertainties and say a few things about 
computational resources that are required uh, to do simulations of lattice gauge theories, just to give you an idea of what the scale is of these kind of calculations typically. Uh, then I will uh, overview some common methods that are used in the field and their impact. So I will talk about things like sparse linear solvers, multigrid solvers, and hybrid Monte Carlo, mostly descriptively um, at this point, and say how these methods have impacted the current state of the art in the specific case of lattice QCD and in terms of the resource requirements that are required. And then I will talk a bit about some practical and technical aspects of implementing lattice, lattice gauge theory kernels. And for that, I would refer to a specific example, which is uh, the case of the Schwinger model and the Schwinger fermion matrix. Okay, so uh, um, starting from our introduction. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, maybe I have a question uh, on, on the last exercise. So it's, uh, maybe it's a naive one. Uh, yeah, exactly. And yes. but he, I mean, in the uh, in the previous uh, in in the matrix matrix multiplication, we counted uh, uh, both, of course, when we re when we read the matrix A and B, and when we wrote on uh, the M K number of the matrix C. Uh, so that yes. that gives the results of M N plus M K plus M M K, and uh, in the second one. If I understood correctly, we uh, um, we in the input out, in the number of input output uh, we calculated three times n. That is the uh, that we are reading x y, uh, but not the the writing on on uh, on y. Uh, is, is it right or? No, we are counting the rising on y. That's why it's three times n. So it's basically otherwise it would be two times n. So we are so basically we ah yes yes. So the second basically the uh, yeah yeah sorry. So the the first x y and x y are it's just one reading and then we count the, the writing of y and the writing of y. Okay. Ah yeah okay yeah here I mean yes you, you just need to. To access yeah, one. So yeah, sure. You only need to read X real once. Just because you go to the next line, that doesn't mean yeah, you yeah, can sure, assume sure. that this stays in some register or cache. And, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Good to clarify. Okay. Uh, okay, since we're here, any other questions? Yes. Okay, no. All right. Um, Yes, okay, so let's start from the very basics. So, um, so gauge theories on the lattice. Again, mostly I will refer to QCD, um, but uh, a lot of these apply also to uh, other gauge theories. But um, typically you have an action, uh, which is an integral over some Lagrangian density and Lagrangian includes a fermion part and a gluon part, right? So I will use throughout the notation M to mean this uh, fermion matrix, which is, uh, you know, some covariant derivative minus mass uh, like this. And then the, the, um, the, the gauge part of the action is, well, for abelian theories, you won't have this, uh, uh, this part here. Um, so it's basically the, um, this is the gluon self-interacting term. So the fermion fields are the psi here, psi, psi bar and psi, and then the gauge fields are the, uh, I, 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 I symbolize them with G here. Um, usually this is symbolized with A for, for, for QED, for example. Okay, and then um, when we want to compute observables, and typically we use the so-called Feynman Path integral formulation, right? So, so um, uh, we take an integral over the the field. So these are functional integrals uh, 
over the fields um, with the action, complex action, the complex exponent here, e to the minus is the action uh, uh, over the observable. And then the partition function is basically just, just the normalization, right? So it's the whole integrand here, but without the observable is what is in the set. And here, what I silently did is I put the, these U's instead of the G's, which so I introduced the so-called link variables, which are basically the integral uh, of the uh, gluon fields over some, you know, some path. Okay. Right. So, so, uh, so that's just the Feynman path integral again. So that's the integral that we want to. Uh, solve in order to that's the yeah that's the integral we want to carry out in order to get expectation values of the desired observables but of course uh, we run into some problems immediately because first of all these fermion fields in this representation are Grassmann valued right so they're not very easy to represent on computers without using huge resources and the exponents right this, which we will interpret, we want to interpret as a probability is complex. So um, uh, we have to carry out the integration over the fermion fields explicitly, right? So, and then uh, a weak rotation to Euclidean time and arrive like something like this. So basically what, what we can, what, why we can do the integration over the fermion fields is first of all, because Got just stepping back here a bit, because the, the the fermions appear as a, you know, as a as a bilinear here over this matrix, but but also um, because uh, the fermions being fermions can only appear as uh, pairs in endpoint functions in the observable. Uh, so. Doing the integration over the uh, fermion fields will uh, give you a term here where now you need to compute the logarithm of the determinant of uh, the fermion matrix M. And then the, the observable here, which used to be a function of the Grassmann value psi and psi bar, is becomes a function of the inverse of the matrix. Okay, so that, yeah, so that that's just the uh, Wick's theorem, which you can work out with Wick contraction. So basically, the, what I said before that because the observable is some endpoint function of fermion fields, then doing the integration over the fermion fields here of psi by psi, what you obtain is combinations of the inverse of the fermion matrix, okay? All right, so, um, that was a bit, a bit fast, but, but what, what I, I want you to take is that at the end, we have an integral like this. So there is a real valued uh, weight up here. So a real valued um, probability uh, that we can evaluate. There's no Grassmann variables anymore. And this is, is now uh, the expression for the observable that we want. So there's two issues still remaining here, computational issues. So first of all, is the fact that we have the determinant of uh, M in this, prob in this uh, probability here, right? So first of all, this is an issue because the determinant of the matrix is on non-local. So any change of U at any point uh, in, in the, in, on the lap, or at any uh, point will change the, the determinant non-locally. And also uh, the calculation of the determinant of a matrix of size N scales as, as, as best with N squared, right? So what we can do in this case is introduce pseudo fermions. So one can show that uh, the exponent of the logarithm of the determinant is 
equal to now I've introduced new uh, integration variables, complex valued integration variables, phi and pi bar. Uh, and when you integrate over those variables, uh, you, you obtain the logarithm of the determinant of f. Okay, so all this is to say that in the, the, in the inverse of this matrix M appears basically everywhere uh, in, in our in our workflow and lattice gauge theory in last field theory. So um, the good thing is that M is sparse, mm -hmm. so that uh, applying M on a vector is just order N operations, right? So if it would be dense, then applying M on a vector would require order N square operations, but because it's sparse, it's basically the diagonal plus some elements around the diagonal, then this is order N operations. And because it is sparse, M inverse on a vector can be obtained by iterative methods, which, and we'll talk about this a bit uh, later also in some future slides. So um, you can get the inverse of M on a vector phi by some number N small of applications of M on phi where this small N is typically much smaller than the size of n. Okay, so um, in this form, right, uh, this uh, in solving this integral with numerical methods becomes uh, feasible. So, so I want to talk about bit now about the discretization. So. Um, uh, we had introduced before these uh, link variables, and these are discretized now by taking the path uh, uh, that you integrate along these gluon variables to be uh, a fixed uh, size. So that, uh, yeah, so you put the, the you discretize your space time on a, a multi-dimensional lattice. So for QCD, this will be four-dimensional, for example. And then the links are defined as the integrals between uh, neighboring sites of this exponent of the gluon fuels in this case. So when you, when you define the links like this, then your action, right? So the, the, this, the F mu nu, F mu nu part of the action is expressed as a, a closed product so the average over the whole lattice of this closed product of links, which is called the plaquette and is symbolized here with uh, P mu. Okay. So um, we have a space-time lattice uh, with a lattice spacing of A that it basically determines our, our cutoff. The uh, fermion action, on the other hand, okay, um, uh, is written in terms of covariant derivatives, and here's just an example in the case of the, the Wilson action. So uh, notice that uh, what this does is just um, so the action of M on the fermion field psi only involves the nearest neighbors. So you have here x plus a mu hat and x minus a mu hat, and then you have uh, psi of x here. So um, applying the matrix M on a vector psi only requires uh, uh, you know about the nearest neighbors of each side. So this is the... Uh, Four dimensional stencil. It couples nearest neighbors in psi, and this is written in terms of a covariant derivative. So, in order to maintain uh, the gauge covariance of the derivative, uh, every time we take a point split uh, difference like this one, every time we have a derivative, then this uh, must multiply with uh, the gauge link variables here. Okay, so in discretizing, putting our action, so the fermion part and the, and the gauge part on a lattice, 
So what, what freedom have we introduced? Well, um, so first of all, as in the, as in the continuum theory, uh, what we have is what we have the choice of doing is determining the fermion mass, right? So this is still a bare parameter of our theory. And we will see later why uh, uh, setting a lighter fermion mass becomes more, uh, it makes uh, simulations more expensive. Uh, the second uh, freedom we have is choosing the coupling, which is really a proxy for choosing uh, the lattice spacing. So whereas in the bare theory we have a coupling constant, this uh, is uh, mapped in the lattice theory to uh, the, cup the coupling constant. And um, for a given volume, right, if you have the same physical volume, then of course uh, a bigger A means less grid points, um, which in turn means um, uh, that it's generally cheaper. And then the other thing we can decide in this case, uh, which is not uh, the case of the continuum, is that we can decide the volume uh, of, uh, of our simulation. So uh, the number of grid points in, in each dimension, let's say. Okay, but what I sort of passed over, and I won't stay too much on it, but what we can do is also choose, in this case, the discretization scheme. And I'm just throwing their names that you might be familiar with but there are uh, different kinds, different flavors or different methods to, to, to discretize the action on the lattice. So I just showed you one, um, but between them, there are trade-offs and advantages. So for example, some may be computationally faster, but uh, break, for example, explicitly chiral symmetry, whereas others might uh, retain chiral symmetry, but might be more expensive to, to simulate. Uh, what should happen though is that eventually if you take uh, all the limits that you should take, so if you take the lattice spacing to zero, you take the infinite volume limit and you set all your masses to the physical masses, then observables computed in any of these choices of discretization schemes, which I put here, should eventually agree. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk a bit now a bit about the sort of the typical workflow. So um, we wrote this uh, expression for uh, the, uh, the uh, Feynman path integral after we take a wick rotation and to uh, real time uh, and we integrate out the fermion fields and we express the determinants in this way then now we can um, uh, carry out this integration via a, a Markov chain one to Carlo. Okay, so um, what we want to do is generate uh, representative configurations of the gauge fields U with probability uh, given here. Right, so um, we want to draw configurations of the gauge fields and we want uh, the probability of a given gauge field to be given by uh, this expression here. And so in a typical workflow, uh, what we do is we run such a Markov chain Monte Carlo and then generate a set of these gauge fields U. And then we uh, do uh, so-called observable measurements. And I put measurements in, uh, in uh, quotes uh, to compute um, uh, expectation values of fermion or gluon correlation functions of desired observables over these. And so here I'm reiterating that the inversion of the Dirac matrix, so the inversion of that, so obtaining the inverse of this M matrix is new, needed in both stages of the calculation. So you need it uh, when you compute the the, the probability, right, because it appears in the exponent here. And uh, you need it during the so-called measurements, because we said the observables are expressed in terms of the inverse of this matrix. 
So, and then this calculation of this inverse of M becomes basically the most computationally demanding part of any of uh, these uh, 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 lattice QCD simulations. So uh, just to understand a bit where the current state of the art lies uh, uh, in terms of simulation. So, um, so yeah, I talked about the, you know, about uh, the, the freedom of choice that we have, the volume, and the lattice spacing, and the quark masses. So uh, maybe it's good to give some, some typical uh, or, orders of sort of ballpark uh, quotes of what the um, typical uh, modern day simulations look like. So in, in current um, simulations, the typical box length is about five to seven Fermi, whereas lattice spacings range from 0.06 to 0.1 Fermi. Uh, some simulations you might find it even larger, 0.15, uh, but typically you don't find uh, simulations with the lattice spacing slower than 0.05 Fermi. So uh, you just do a simple division here and yeah, so uh, current lattice sizes range somewhere between 64 cube lattices to 128 cube lattices. And usually uh, we take the uh, time extent to be uh, twice or in any case larger than, than the volume extent. So that gives you an idea of the number of grid points that uh, uh, we have in uh, uh, current uh, last simulations. And then let's, let's talk a bit about the requirements. So what does that mean in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the data requirements, right? So link variables are color matrices in the case of QCD. So each one of these links is three by three and complex valued. And then you have four directions in a four dimensional lattice, right? Where this points to. So uh, that uh, yields uh, 36 complex numbers per each one of these uh, grid points, right? For, for each one of the four dimensional uh, grid points of the four dimensional lattice. And that's one data type we have. And then the other data types that we have are the inverse of um, the Dirac matrix. But of course, this inverse is unfeasible to hold all elements of. So typically, uh, what we have is the so-called propagators, which are either just columns or rows of this inverse of the matrix. Or more generally, it will be just a, a data type which holds the inverse of the matrix on some appropriately defined uh, vector here. And these are also complex valued, um, but they are color vectors and they also have a Dirac component. So those are 12 complex numbers per grid point. So if I take an, a lattice, which is sort of intermediate between these two, uh, which I, uh, sizes which I arrived to here, then uh, a gauge field is uh, something like, so these link variables U, a field of those link variables U is about 100 gigabytes. And one of these vectors is, is uh, about 30 gigabytes. And so if you go now to a typical implementation where you want to do uh, a, a simulation, right, of Markov chain Monte Carlo to generate these gauge fields, then this tells you that you need to have in memory a few numbers of copies of each of these um, of each of these fields. Well, actually, what you typically need is to have at least two of these gauge fields in memory. Maybe you can get away with having one copy, but usually you have two copies of the gauge field in memory, and then of order ten of these. Uh, inverses of the matrix M, you know, you need to compute this M inverse on these phi's that I showed before to compute the determinant. Uh, 
So the, the RAM requirements come up to a order of terabytes, right? So one, two terabytes, some, somewhere in that range. 4 and 96 cube times 192 lattice. Okay, so those are your typical RAM requirements. Um, and that just tells you that basically you, you, you really need to, to paralyze this problem right? because a, a typical uh, node, right, only very fat nodes nowadays on supercomputers have up to one terabyte. Uh, and if you go to GPUs, uh, so if you want to run your program on, on GPUs, then uh, the, the biggest memory now on GPUs is 32 gigabytes, right? So you would need to use a order, you know, 60 GPUs in order to run a simulation like this. Um, and then for a typical ensemble where you would, you know, run your Markov chain Monte Carlo, then you would generate uh, somewhere of the order of a, of a thousand of these configurations and then to store those you would need a border petabyte right of storage requirements okay so that's all to say uh how you you follow through from um how, how we can sort of follow from defining the the problem on a lattice to what the requirements are uh, in in modern day the lattice QCD calculations. So let's talk a bit about the so those are the data types and the, the sort of the data requirements. And I want to talk a bit about the computational characteristics now. So, um, so yeah, so it's a computationally demanding field so one thing that makes it computationally demanding is that usually you have four dimensional theories right so in the case of qcd which just immediately means that the problem scales at least with l to the four so when you increase one side then the number of computations you need to do uh, increases with the fourth power of whatever that increase was Second point is that this is a Markov chain Monte Carlo process, which means that you introduce, you have a statistical error. So your expectation values that you compute, you compute statistically and these statistical, uh, and these uh, oops, expectation values, sorry, have a standard deviation, right? Uh, uh, so their, their averages fluctuate around you know, according to a Gaussian with which um, uh, with statistical errors that, that scale with one over square root the number of, of statistics that you've computed. And the fact that you've computed, that you've wick rotated now to Euclidean time and you have Euclidean time correlation functions means that your signal decays uh, with um, uh, the, the dimension uh, that you, that you take, the, with the distance that you take the correlation function. So just indicatively, for example, um, uh, a very simple observable that we compute uh, uh, on the lattice is the so-called two-point correlation function, where you have some correlation function between a combination of quarks at the uh, final state and a combination of quarks at the initial state. And because these are separated by Euclidean time, then um, uh, what you get uh, as a result of, of these correlation functions is uh, an infinite sum of uh, all states right that have the, the desired quantum numbers uh, with uh, the energy here in the exponent um, and usually what you want to obtain in, in such a case uh, although this is not uh, uh, always the case but um, Tip, although um, usually what you want to compute is say the ground state uh, energy here, which means that you need to take this separation large enough uh, in order for the first exponent to, to uh, only for the first exponent to, um, to survive here. And then you can obtain, for example, the ground state uh, uh, energy. 
And of course, you've had the lectures also for resonances, etc., where you've seen uh, other methods, uh, uh, for example, the GVP to get uh, uh, also resonant uh, excited states and resonances. Now, um, so because this is okay, so if you compute this in a Markov chain Monte Carlo, then what you're computing in here is basically expectation values of these. Uh, so you're computing this correlation function on a given Markov chain. And so uh, the uh, values of the correlation functions will have a statistical error which scales like this. But the signal, on the other hand, scales with um, the, the exponent here which means that um, the signal decays exponentially. Okay? So you have an exponentially decaying uh, signal. So if I, just to give an example of this, so this is what such a correlation function looks like. So here I'm not plotting the correlation function itself, but I'm plotting um, the logarithm of the derivative of this uh, correlation function. So what you should see is basically that as the time separation, which is plotted on the x-axis here, is increased, then the higher, I'm hiding them there, so as you increase the time separation, then the higher exponentials should be suppressed, and you should be left only with the first exponential here. And so in this kind of plot, you should see a flat line. And you see that what you're trying to do is you are trying to take time separation as large as possible in order to, to see where this plateau region is reached. Uh, but um, you uh, uh, need to take it as early as possible because if you wait too long, so if you go too far in the time separation, then of course uh, this exponentially decaying signal will, will, will kill you, okay? So you, you're basically looking for a window uh, here to to, to uh, fit this constant uh, behavior. Okay, so that's what, what we mean here by uh, statistical error scales one over square root of n, whereas the signal decays uh, exponentially. Okay, so it is, in, for these reasons, a computationally demanding field, but it is also well suited, we should say, for uh, parallel computers. And the the reason is that um, the, the, the common op operation that we need to do, which as I said, is the inversion of this Dirac matrix, has uh, nearest neighbor communications. And so there are predictable and regular communication patterns. And this has potential for good strong scaling on parallel systems. Now the other thing, and we will see this also towards the end of this lecture is that um, uh, relatively simple compute kernels are involved and so you have deterministic memory access patterns and that, that creates a potential for making potentially high, highly efficient uh, kernel implementations. So uh, just to give you an idea, Co typical computational requirements, right? So for example, uh, if uh, you want to uh, simulate one of these example lattices that I talked about, maybe you want to generate some 500 configurations with uh, an intermediate lattice spacing and uh, the prime mass at the physical point, then you would require about, this is ballpark now, about 100 million core hours, okay? Um, so those are the typical modern day uh, computational requirements. And then if you want to do a typical analysis, so now you have these configurations and um, you want to compute some observables like the two point correlation functions I showed before. And usually you need for each one of these configurations about 10,000 to a few tens of thousands of matrix inversions which is typical for Hadron structure requirements. And that gives you a ballpark estimate of the analysis component of being about 10 million GPU hours. So these kind of uh, 
resource requirements here, 100 million core hours and 10, 10 million GPU hours are sort of on the higher end of what you can get from a large scale computer time application on uh, the big supercomputers in Europe, okay? Okay, so um, those were some, just some general uh, comments about the computational requirements, the data requirements, and why the lattice gauge theories are suited for HPC and need HPC. And then in the next slides, I'll talk a bit about some of the state-of-the-art methods that I use. This will be a bit descriptive, okay, but I'll talk a bit about the, uh, some of the standard methods that are used nowadays to achieve these kind of um, uh, simulations. And I want to talk about a bit about um, uh, iterative solvers. So, uh, as we said, we need to repeatedly invert this matrix. The inversion of this fermion matrix appears in the calculation of the probability, right, in the exponent, but it also appears when we want to compute observables. So, also during simulations, we say the fermion calculation, also during analysis. And so, what we're repeatedly asked to do is to basically find, uh, find y in this equation. In other words, we want to find the inverse of the operator m on some appropriately defined right-hand side. And uh, a well-known way to uh, obtain estimates of y, right, of the left-hand side, is to build it from uh, a, so, a, a so-called Krilov subspace, which is built from, you know, um, applications of the matrix M on a B. So uh, we're looking for algorithms that will build uh, our desired uh, vector Y from linear combinations of, of uh, these kind of, um, of vectors here. And what we want to do is minimize iteratively the so-called error, which is defined like this. So it's the distance of the left-hand side up here from the right-hand side. But of course, we don't know M inverse of, of, of B. Uh, uh, that's precisely the point. That's exactly what we want. So since this is unknown in practice, what we minimize is the so-called residual, which is basically M applied to the left of this. So M Y minus B. Okay, and examples of such iterative solvers, which I'm sure you've heard uh, talked about, is the so called conjugate gradient method, generalized minimum residual, stabilized by conjugate gradient. These are just some names. So I will um, talk about conjugate gradient, which is sort of the most basic uh, of these iterative solvers. So um, in the case of Conjugate gradient, uh, one complication is that it requires a Hermitian matrix, but that's easy to obtain. So if this is this, the equation that you want to solve for Y, then you just multiply it to the left with the Hermitian conjugate, right, M dagger. And so basically what you want to solve is now uh, uh, this uh, equation here where now the right-hand side is not B anymore, but M dagger B. Now, a nice thing about the conjugate gradient is that it's guaranteed mon monotonic convergence, meaning that uh, this quantity where R is the residual, right? So R is, is basically uh, M Y minus B. So this, this uh, dot product is guaranteed to Greece with every iteration. So um, we don't need to go into the details of conjugate gradient. This is not the purpose here, but I just want to show you a bit uh, what, look, what it looks like just to, just to point out a few things. So you start with an initial guess X, you compute an initial residual, and then uh, what's, so A in this case is M dagger M, right? So it's this uh, matrix here that we want to invert. This is called A here. Um, what I want to point out is basically that this uh, whole 
uh, process here requires just one matrix vector multiplication, right? Just one application of A of P and everything else is just linear algebra operations. So, <coughs> so in terms of a parallel application, right? So we said that the application of the matrix on a vector requires nearest neighbor communications. Uh, so it requires knowing the uh, coupling uh, uh, nearest neighbors. So that all happens uh, here, whereas all other operations here are basically uh, uh, element-wise operations, right? So that's why this kind of algorithms are well suited for parallel computers if you can have an efficient implementation of the matrix vector multiplication. Okay, and I said the um, uh, uh, CG, one of the nice properties is that it has a monotonic convergence. I just want to show you an example of what this process would look like. So um, here is a, the, the residual on the y-axis here plotted against the number of iterations that we're doing in order to solve uh, an equation like this. And so basically you see uh, uh, if I plot this on a log log plot, uh, then you see an exponential, uh, exponentially decreasing uh, uh, residual with a number of iterations. And then you just have to decide what the target residual is to stop. Uh, and so this is conjugate gradient. And if you do the same inversion with some of the other methods, which might not have the same nice properties as CG, then for example, here in this case is by conjugate gradient, uh, stabilized by conjugate gradient by CG stab, uh, is not guaranteed to have a monotonic convergence. So you see um, things like this. Uh, uh, so the residual sometimes jumps up, down in this way. And uh, in this case, uh, we also show the case of GCR, which is good if you want to get faster to a, a higher residual, but a bad if you want to get higher precision uh, faster compared to CG. This is just to say that these, you know, these uh, uh, iterative solvers come in different flavors, but a common component is that they all look something like this. So there's a matrix vector multiplication at some point and then linear algebra operations uh, that, uh, uh, that usually do not require, uh, are trivially parallelizable, let's say, and well suited for the power of computers. Okay, so I want to talk about some of the challenges uh, when using these linear solvers. So the first thing is that the, uh, the residual for a given number of iterations is re related to the so-called condition number of the matrix. And the condition number Ka is just the ratio of the maximum to minimum eigenvalue, okay? And so the bigger the condition number, the more iterations you will need to arrive at a given residual. Okay, so for large condition numbers, right? The residual goes uh, like this, where n is the number of iterations and uh, this is just the scalar number, condition number, maximum eigenvalue over minimum eigenvalue. So what this means practically is that um, uh, in the case of uh, the QCD action, uh, sorry, in the case of lattice gauge theories where you have fermion operators that you want to invert, the smallest eigenvalue is related to the fermion mass, right? And then the, the, the largest taken value is more or less uh, uh, constant as you decrease the, the quark mass. So as the quark mass becomes smaller, lambda min becomes smaller, Ka becomes larger. And so the number of iterations you need to reach a given residual explodes. And this is the so-called critical slowing down in terms of the inversion of the Fermi matrix. So this is an example of what this critical slowing down looks like. So on the y-axis here, I have time to solution given in terms of core hours. And on the x-axis here, I have the bare, in this case, twisted quark mass because it's some 
special definition of the action, but you can just think of this as a bare quark mass. And you can see this is a logarithmic scale here, and you can see that the uh, time to solution to reach a fixed inversion, uh, in fixed uh, residual here, uh, explodes exponentially. And so um, this uh, critical slowing down uh, has been addressed in the past uh, decade or so with newer methods uh, coming up in order to address it. And um, one very successful algorithm I want to talk about is uh, so-called multi-grid methods um, in which you can find the original uh, uh, papers here. But basically they rely on uh, uh, preconditioning of your matrix uh, by uh, solving it first on coarser grids before solving it on the final. So, um, what 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 this uh, what these methods do uh, on a sort of higher level? Uh, I won't get into the details here, but basically, what one does is uh, one finds a way to map. Of the, the lattice that you want to invert your matrix on, you find a way to map it onto a coarser matrix. Um, and in this case, this looks to be uh, geometric, but this doesn't have to be geometric. It can also be also in other degrees of freedom of the matrix. So not just in the volume in the, in the, in the lattice sites. So, but then you solve uh, your uh, uh, matrix on the, the, the so-called so coarse grid, and then you map it back to your fine grid and use that as a guess then for your uh, regular linear solver. And uh, this is just the previous plot that I showed in the last slide uh, with the red points here, uh, which showed the critical slowing down uh, and uh, once you uh, tune appropriately this method, uh, then you can uh, obtain this kind of scaling when you use uh, multi-grid. And here I'm showing a specific flavor of multi-grid. So this has allowed, this kind of methods, this multi-grid methods have allowed in the recent years, uh, simulations directly at um, uh, physical quark masses uh, you can see here that you obtain uh, almost an order 100 improvement. So this point here, this vertical line here, is the point where the bare twist, the bare quark mass corresponds to the physical quark masses. Um, and this at a cost of a minor setup for building uh, the matrices that map you from the fine grid to the coarse grid and from the coarse grid back to the fine. So uh, this uh, plot is specific to twisted mass, so-called twisted mass fermions, which is a given formulation of uh, QCD, but uh, these algorithms have also have been developed for uh, other fermionic actions, okay? So that's one example of advancement in the past decade that is allowed for physical point simulations. Um, and another thing I want to talk about is some standard methods used in the Markov chain Monte Carlo. So again, I'm just writing again what we said in the first slide. So uh, in a typical workflow, what you want is to generate field configurations U according to a given probability. And uh, I'm sure you uh, have all seen uh, examples of this. Um, so uh, what you want to do is basically update the fields U according to some transition probability. So some prescription uh, that will give you uh, a, new, a new configuration U prime, starting from uh, uh, an original configuration UQ with some probability, UK with some probability. And um, if this transition probability uh, fulfills some uh, uh, requirements, the first being uh, egot egoticity, meaning that 
in any finite number of steps you can get from any configuration to any configuration and balance, which means that this transition probability, transition uh, probability is related to the original probability you want via this transformation. Then you can show uh, that uh, the use that you will generate will converge to having probability P of U. So in a, in a typical workflow using Metropolis sampling, what you do is you draw a trial U prime from an arbitrary distribution, right? This is P prime of U, not the desired distribution. And then you accept this new configuration as the next configuration in the Markov chain with a probability that is related to the ratio of the probability you're drawing to compared to the desired probability, right? So um, if you can draw directly from the desired probability P of U, then this will be min of one comma one, and then you will always accept these configurations. Okay, so that's just a trivial uh, consistency check. So this Metropolis algorithm satisfies the two requirements that we had before. And another nice feature is that because here um, the probabilities are all ratios of each other, then the partition function uh, that you would otherwise need to compute drops out. So you don't need to compute the partition function. You can, uh, you can just compute, yeah, let me keep it back. You just need to compute e to the minus sg minus uh, the fermion part here without computing c. Okay, and now if you do such a process, if you carry out such a process and have a Markov chain of these u's, then the configurations u are distributed according to the desired probability p u, and then observables are just averages and the errors. As we said before, scale like one of those square root of n statistics. Okay, so um, a few terms that we need to introduce here is the so-called acceptance rate, which is the ratio of accepted trials in the Monte Carlo over the total number of configurations. And usually this can be, this acceptance rate can be tunable according to how big steps you take when you propose a new trial. And then this, then there's the autocorrelation uh, time, which basically tells you the probability of having some number of rejections in a row. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, uh, autocorrelation time is loosely uh, the value of, of uh, this, this length uh, for which this uh, autocorrelation goes to zero and you can formally uh, define an integrated autocorrelation time in this way. So, in, we talked about critical slowing down for the fermion inversion, but in this case, uh, critical, there is also a critical slowing down in the simulation, which is when this, auto this auto integrated autocorrelation time diverges uh, as a function of some uh, value some parameter of theory uh, approaching uh, its critical value. So for example, as we approach a phase transition. So again, um, the autocorrelation is the probability of having some number of rejections in a row with, um, uh, with the uh, convention that uh, uh, the autocorrelation at zero is one. So um, rejections means that you basically you, you, you need to uh, draw a new trial uh, again and again. So, uh, uh, um, and uh, critical slowing down basically means that as you approach some critical point uh, of the parameters, then your simulation repeatedly rejects uh, configurations and you need to simulate longer and longer in order to get uh, varied enough uh, configurations. So uh, 
yeah so um the uh autocorrelation time largely depends on the way that you decide to draw your trials hmm, and how closely that approximates the real probability that you're trying to uh, uh, simulate i just like to show you an example so it's not important uh, what this is from uh, but uh, i just write here this is from uh, a simple five to the four model where one computes the two point susceptibility so what's plotted on the x-axis here is the number of monte carlo iterations so basically the markov chain so we're doing a simulation and we have a configuration for each point on this x-axis and for each <coughs> each of these configurations we're computing the so-called uh, two-point susceptibility okay so it's not important what this um what this uh, two point susceptibility exactly is, but suffice to say uh, that we plot it as a function of the configurations here. And so what, what we're doing is we're changing some parameters of the theory so that we're approaching criticality as we go from top to bottom. And what we see is uh, basically that uh, as we approach criticality, um, we see a so-called freezing of this, this, um, this observable here. So we get repeated configurations where this, this uh, observable here has very similar or same values because a lot of configurations are being rejected as we approach this criticality. So this is critical stuff going down. And then if I compute the uh, autocorrelation time, which I defined in the previous slide, for each one of uh, these uh, uh, runs, Monte Carlo runs, then you get something like this. So this point here is the autocorrelation time of this plot up here. The second point is the, uh, the, the second point here. So we approach criticality from left to right in this case by varying a parameter uh, of, of this theory. And you see that this integrated autocorrelation time explodes, which means that as we approach uh, this uh, limit, then we need to run for, 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 for longer and longer uh, times in order to get uh, uh, a, a reasonable acceptance of our Markov chain here. Okay, so uh, this also happens in QCD. Uh, and uh, uh, one standard method used in the literature to overcome this is the so-called uh, hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm uh, uh, for updating the links, okay? So this uh, is uh, motivated by uh, uh, molecular dynamics. Um, and so uh, this is just here, I'm just, just writing again the standard thing we want to compute, and I just replaced the, you know, the glue on fields minus the, uh, the determinant calculation with just e to the minus s. And what can, one can do is just add uh, Gaussian variables here, and then this equality will hold if these, uh, uh, you know, if these variables I introduced are, um, drawn normally because this integral over pi bar pi of e to the minus pi square over two is just is just a constant right so i just multiply by constant uh on the top and the bottom and i've introduced this e to the minus pi square over two uh, factor here now um these pi variables now can be seen as pseudo momenta so they can be seen as momenta which are conjugate to the, let's say, the position uh, variables, which are the gauge fields. And so you can see this, this, uh, this term here as a, a sort of a Hamiltonian, okay? Um, and what does that allow us to do? Well, it allows us to evolve the pi's and the u's here, so these variables, 
evolve them in a way that will uh, not change age. And so that will not change this probability here. So if we arrive at the, at a set of gauge links, so if we evolve you according to Hamilton's equation, then we can arrive at a trial for u prime, which has not changed the probability here, right? Because we have, we know how to evolve these u's in a way that this Hamiltonian remains constant by using Hamilton's equations. So practically what we do is really we use some uh, symplectic integrator like for example the simple cases leapfrog here and uh, uh, yeah so it's not important exactly what's going on here but what 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 I want you to see is so you do you do this integration in time steps so in one time step you evolve pi the pies the the, the sort of called, called momenta in another time step you evolve the gauge links you do this iteratively and until some uh, time that you decided uh, t uh, big t for a given number of time steps and then you take the final gauge field u prime there as your new trial in the markov chain um, so this gives you an example of a global updating algorithm. So all the variables of u are updated all together rather than doing local updates, which you might be familiar with, for example, in the Ising model, where you might go and update one spin at a time. This introduces the so-called fictitious time tau and uh, some time steps that you need to tune. So there's more tunable parameters in this uh, model uh, and um, uh, what, what is important is that you need to calculate these so-called forces which is just the derivative of this uh, action with respect to the gauge links uh, at each of these time steps um, uh, and this uh, derivative here gives rise to so basically um, uh, that, that means that in each time step is what I want to say, that each time step you need to compute uh, this uh, action here for the, for the gauge links at that time step, which basically means you need to do a new set of inversions at each time step. Um, one thing to note is that this numerical integration means that um, there will be uh, a numerical error, right? In, uh, in the Hamiltonian between the, the final step and the initial step. So if we were to solve Hamilton's equations uh, exactly, so as you take the time step to be zero, this integration error will be zero, but because it's finite, there will be a, a finite difference between the initial and final uh, Hamiltonian value. Uh, and that can be solved by doing uh, a final accept reject step at the end. Uh, of uh, of uh, the the integration. So in practice, uh, this uh, hybrid Monte Carlo uh, people employ uh, additional improvements, and uh, I won't say any details here, but um, I just put some literature. So there's a so-called multiple time step integration where you can break. Uh, this uh, iteration step into uh, multiple levels having a different time step. Um, uh, there's higher order integration schemes where instead of using leapfrog, uh, you can use uh, um, uh, integration schemes which uh, have a correction at a different order of delta tau. And there's other tricks such as uh, so-called mass preconditioning uh, uh, which you, you can take a look at if you're interested there, which uh, are applied to um, uh, hybrid Monte Carlo. Okay, and um, uh, uh, so an example, I'll just give you an example now of how all these methods can, can come together. Um, and so that, this, this comes now from some personal experience and uh, some simulations that I've been involved in but this is also true for uh, other uh, collaborations in, in Lattice QCD. So um, 
So these are, I want to show you some improvements for, to give you an idea of how algorithmic improvements and um, the, the result of co computers becoming faster can, can be combined to uh, sort of to make progress in, in this field. So um, this is um, what I'm plotting here is um, the cost of doing, of doing one, one update using hybrid Monte Carlo. Um, uh, in terms of core hours. Uh, and on the x-axis here, I have the, the lattice volume. So I'm counting the core hours in terms of the lattice volume. And this was a situation five years ago when we hadn't included multigrid in our simulations. So uh, this is a real data point of a lattice that was simulated the box length of 48. So it was 48 cubed times 96 lattice points. And it needed some something over 10,000 core hours for each molecular dynamics update. And if we were to go to larger volumes, then this dashed line shows you what the scaling would have been because we know how this scales with the lattice volume. So adding a uh, multigrid uh, uh, solvers uh, into uh, the uh, hybrid Monte Carlo, which means adding a multi-grid solver, and I'll just step back here, in this crucial part here of the action where you have this determinant calculation and you need, need to repeatedly do this with the time steps, um, brought these curves down by uh, almost two orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, the multigrid, if you just follow the, the lower uh, dash line here, which is for two flavors of, of, um, of quarks, then this went down to this green curve here. And we were able to simulate with much less resources, a larger lattice at 64 cubed. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, achieved in a couple of years. And of course, um, as these, uh, uh, methods are improved, then um, also computer time uh, improves. And so the available core hours you have in a given uh, year uh, also increase. And then in the last step, what we did was we changed our integrator to a fourth order integration scheme. So that part that uh, I showed you the leapfrog algorithm for, uh, we changed it to a four fourth order integration scheme, okay? And that changed basically the scaling with respect to the volume. Uh, and so we were able to simulate uh, an even larger lattice now with almost the same computational resources that we needed for the 64 cube. And this happened in, uh, up to 2018. So I just want to give you an example of how the combination, as I said, of computer time improvements plus um, uh, improvements in algorithms, including the multigrid, including different order interfaces in the hybrid Monte Carlo, all coalesce, let's say, to uh, improve, uh, uh, to be able to do larger volumes and in less time. And, and this is not just uh, uh, in the case of uh, 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 work that I've personally been involved in, but if you just want to see a map of all the different collaborations uh, and some uh, simulation points uh, around here. So uh, this is here, um, what I'm plotting on the x-axis is the uh, lattice spacing here, and on the y-axis is the pion mass, and then each different point here is a simulation point of different uh, collaborations. And some of these collaborations you might also be involved in like uh, CLS, for example, uh, probably uh, uh, those of you in Regensburg are using their configurations or the Edinburgh people are using RP RBC lattices. Uh, this is also to say that um, in the past five or 10 years, all these methods have allowed multiple collaborations to uh, uh, tackle uh, critical slowing down and be able to um, uh, simulate directly 
at the physical point and also at increasing uh, volumes. Okay, um, I had one, I had a couple of slides, uh, but they would also fit in the next lecture. So I think we've introduced a lot of things today. Um, and I will uh, save the next few slides for the next lecture. So the next few slides are a bit more uh, technical where I take um, the Schwinger model, so the fermion matrix in the Schwinger model. So this M, M fermion matrix defined for a given, uh, for a simpler theory than QCD. And um, I go through some, uh, some considerations when estimating the number of floating point operations and bytes of IO and compute its intensity uh, to demonstrate um, uh, some of the tricks that we play when we try to optimize these kernels. Uh, so that would actually be appropriate to be also an introduction to the hands-on. So since uh, I'm already two minutes over time, and that will require more than 10 minutes. I think I'll stop here. And I will, first of all, like to take any questions if you have of the lecture. And um, then I'd like to ask uh, if anybody has had problems with uh, preparing for the hands-on by following the instructions on the GitHub. So, questions? Um, maybe I can ask uh, two questions. So, mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me? Okay, so... I can hear you. Okay. One of them is uh, from the plot you showed of by CG stab and uh, CG. It, uh, um, the yeah. time to solution, one, I think. Is it didn't seem like by CG stab uh, stab has any advantages. It was slow and it uh, and uh, yeah, I think it was yes, this one the residual. So is there any? Why do people? Okay. Uh, okay. So what I didn't say, uh, and thanks for asking, is that this this plot was. Um, for inverting the twisted mass fermion action. Okay. Um, and uh, there's some specific features which, uh, to be completely honest, I don't quite understand myself exactly why, but there's, there's some features of twisted mass that makes it less suitable for by CG stab. Um, if this was, uh, if, if this was Wilson fermions, uh, so the, the, the nice thing about by CG stab, by the way, is that it, it doesn't need to be applied to the square. Okay, uh, it, it, it can be, it can be just applied to, so it doesn't require a Hermitian matrix, basically. Okay. So it, need, it, it can be applied to a non-Hermitian matrix. Okay. Uh, or at least a non, is it a non-Hermitian or a non-positive matrix. Uh, uh, in any case, for Wilson fermions, you can just apply it to gamma five M rather than than M you, than M dagger M. But I think you need to apply it twice in the iteration. So, so the number of iterations here would be smaller, but you do need to apply it twice. So it is uh, the same computational requirements as applying A on P because A also needs two applications. Anyway, it's not as clear cut, but uh, for your specific question, um, this is because of the action I'm using to apply it to. This is not in general as bad when you use Wilson fermions. Okay, I see, thank you. And um, another yeah. is a naive question, but okay, Draftsman, uh, variables, they don't have any real numeric representation, but they can be represented by matrices, right? I mean, right, yeah. And yeah, and, and the problem is that um, 
um, so I don't know if you if you think about it a bit. I think I guess I mean you can you can represent non-commuting uh, numbers by matrices, right? But but as you increase the number of variables that you want to be non-commuting, these matrices have to become bigger and bigger, right? Yes. Because yes. you want you want all of them to anti-commute with all of them. So so so. If you have an integral, if you want to integrate over these variables, then you basically want sort of a continuous number of these variables to, to integrate over. So that just explodes the size of the matrices that you need to use to represent them. And that just becomes unfeasible on, to do on, on computers. I see, okay. But, but okay. maybe that wasn't your question and I just got no, carried away. That, that was the okay. question. Um, I also have a question also on this slide and it's, uh, and it's just about some curiosity about this GCR because I mean you say that and uh, I mean I knew that the BCG stub doesn't require an emission matrix. Um, what about this GCR? I mean like... Uh, does GCR require emission Okay, I don't, uh, I would have to look up the exact I was just, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if it what? was just a problem, uh, just a, an improvement on, on how fast it is in the, uh, for the first iteration, or if it was also an advantage concerning the fact that it's more general, like the BCG stuff. Mm, no, what, what, I, what, what, what is different about these algorithms is, um, Ooh, um, uh, okay, now I got into trouble showing this plot now because, <laughs> no, no, I mean, this plot is just sorry. to show that you have, you know, <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. No, I'll, I'll give you an answer. It's just the, the purpose of this plot was to show um, that, you know, you have different algorithms, they have different characteristics, they have different yeah, sure. versions and et cetera. But the GCR, okay, just to, they're, they're, so it's the CG, is um, a so-called, um, what's it called? I think single recursion algorithm, which basically means that you only need to keep, um, yeah. you only need to keep one, one vector, one, um, sorry? Yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, you only need to keep, uh, you know, here it's uh, P and P prime, right? So P prime is A on P, and in this iteration, you don't need to have um, uh, any history of the applications of A yes. on previous iterations of P. Yes. Okay. So some of these algorithms, uh, and I think GCR is one of them, require that you hold. Uh, so they have like a, they have like an Arnoldi in, in them, and this mm. Arnoldi method, right? requires that yeah, you yeah. keep all of the them. history of all the, yeah. of all of them or at least some number of them and, until you do a restart yes and so that increases the memory requirements yes. that you need in order to to do some of these methods so that's that's a disadvantage of some of these algorithms that i didn't talk okay. about when i was talking about that thank you I have another question, maybe a small question, as regards the HMC, if you can go to that slide. So uh, you include the pseudo-momenta for the HMC because you want to solve the freezing. But on the other hand, are, you are also increasing the number of floating point by in including these fields in your, in your theory, right? Yeah, I am, yeah. So it, it's still worth it. In terms it of is HPC. still worth it, yes, because, yes, it's still worth it. Okay, so typically, uh, I don't, okay. I don't want to say something inaccurate, but the, the number of time steps that you will do will be of order 10. Okay, 
So, uh, so maybe 20, you know, 10 or 20. So that's how many times you need to invert. Uh, so every time you take ds over du, so, well, maybe I should have said, so what, yeah, so the number of floating point operations increases and what is making them increase is basically that at each time step you need to compute this s again, okay? So that's the main point. That's the main thing that increases your computational requirements. The other part is trivial. So these, these pies, they are just, um, um, they're just complex arrays and this update of u is just adding element by element right so this is this is trivial so i mean this is very cheap what's what's expensive is is this part here where each step you need to reevaluate s and the re reevaluation of s requires the reevaluation of do i have it or I don't have it nearby, is, um, is the reevaluation of this term, right? Every time you reevaluate S, you need to do again, uh, uh, basically um, generate the phi's, invert them, do a dot product, and you might need to do a couple of these so that this integral is approximated and uh, accurately. Um, so th those time steps are of order, yeah, so those time steps are of order 10, okay? I maybe, see. Maybe 12, 16, something like this. So basically you're introducing by tenfold the number of inversions you need to do. But this has turned out to be uh, a very good algorithm for proposing U's that are very likely to be accepted uh, because of the feature that basically you know how to do this without without changing the weight. I see, I understand, thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Um, yeah, I have a question. I'm not sure I understood right whether um, the freezing of observables is somehow related to a small acceptance rate. Because, the, I mean, one usually sees the freezing, uh, I mean, the freezing, how, how much some observable is freezing depends on the observable. But the acceptance rate is something more general. I, I think I just maybe made some confusion. Um, yeah. So let me let me try. Um, well. Uh, I mean, you. Well, I mean, maybe maybe it wasn't supposed to be a general statement, but if if you have a low acceptance rate, right, then observables will freeze because you basically computed them on the on the on the on the same configurations and then the autocorrelation time will explode. Uh, I mean, I'm, I guess that was the statement. So what part of that is, do you think is not, what part of that statement do you think is not accurate? No, oh, no, okay, that, that makes sense. No, because I mean, sometimes one needs to check for observables, which maybe have a big autocorrelation time to make sure things are not correlated. I mean, I've seen, this is sometimes yeah done. okay I, yeah yeah it, it is it is also observable dependent but uh, but I yeah but I still think the general statement holds that, um, that in if you have a bad bad way of proposing you if you have a 
bad method of proposing new configurations and you have continuous rejections, then this will in general explode your autocorrelation time, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's how I meant to say it at least. Yeah. You mean that it will explode the correlation time for all the configuration, basically, for all the observables. That's what you meant with the general statement. Because it's not the observable, the problem, yeah. but it's your algorithm, the problem. And, and, uh, did I understand, you understand correctly? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it can still happen that mm, your, of course, then your algorithm is generating a fine sample and but one particular observable is freezed. That that means that it's not changing. Like I'm thinking about topology and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that. Yes. Okay. And and then and then maybe you need to do special things that are not something that I touched upon. I mean. Okay. okay. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there are no other, yeah. If I may say something, freezing depends, uh, may depend on the algorithm, the way that you, that you drive your algorithm, of course, but, it, but this is subjective, this is it is to error or something, and uh, it may depend also on the action. And of course, on, on topology. Yeah. There are many reasons. Right, Dennis? Yeah, okay, I was just trying to motivate the the hybrid monte carlo here as a globally updating algorithm yeah, yeah, right and and also trying to introduce in general what critical slowing down means in simulation compared to critical slowing down in like when you approach the physical quark mass right so making yeah. this distinction 